I'm Mickey, and this is Wikipedia, where I sit down and chat to doctors, professors, athletes, practitioners, and experts in their fields related to health, nutrition, fitness, and well-being. And I'm delighted that you're here. Morena, people. Happy 2021. Can you believe it? The start to a new year. And with it, the start of many podcasts in 2021 with mates such as Dr. Cliff Harvey, who I am talking to today. We take your questions, we answer them. You can see that our answers aren't necessarily always aligned, but ultimately it gives you a couple of different perspectives with which how to approach your health and nutrition goals. So this is on the back of the first podcast, which I recorded with Cliff and Bella, which was episode four. And you can go back to that podcast if you want a little bit more from Cliff. But just as a reminder, for those people who may not have listened to that podcast or who are unfamiliar with Cliff, Cliff Harvey, PhD, he would be considered New Zealand's expert on the effects of a ketogenic diet in a healthy population. But he knows so much more than that. That's just what his PhD was on. He's been helping people to live healthier, happier lives and to perform better since starting in clinical practice way back in the late 1990s, as Cliff is also a qualified naturopath and clinical nutritionist. Over the many years, he has been privileged to work with a number of different Olympic, professional, Commonwealth and other high-performing athletes, in addition to the general population who are wanting to optimise their health and well-being. And he's also very experienced with regards to helping on a therapeutic basis people who have underlying kind of clinical disorders. Along the way, Cliff has founded or co-founded many successful businesses in the health, fitness and wellness space, including the Nutrition Store Online and the Holistic Performance Institute, which is New Zealand's leading certification and diploma for health, nutrition, health coaching and performance that has many of the world experts teaching on the course, so students are learning from their best. In addition to his nutrition qualifications, he also has over 20 years experience as a strength coach and he holds a diploma in fitness training and health coaching in patient care. And you can find Cliff over at www.cliffharvey.com and you can also find him over on Facebook if you search Cliff Harvey PhD. So as I said today we just continue to answer your questions and have a good kind of deep dive into the topics that we talk about. So sit back, relax and enjoy this conversation that I have with Cliff Harvey. Morena Cliff, how are you doing this morning? Marie dog, I'm doing well. Kete Paiaho. Oh, nice. Um, I would respond with something, but I have nothing. It's okay. I was responding to you. So oh, okay. That's we're, great. We're actually. Do you know, at work, what we do is we start the um, start a lot of our classes with a karakia and our meetings and, and things like that, which is really lovely, actually. I think it's really cool. I, I think learning, even if it's just elements of language, mm. it's just really beneficial for, for brain health and you know, cognition and, and sort of learning how to learn and think in different ways. Because, the, you know, the nuance of language is, is really different depending on which sort of language you're in. And being able to see that sort of that transposition between different languages, I think really helps even just with understanding other people, how, how they think, you know, how they are, how they live their lives. You know, language is such a critical component of that. So I'm a really big advocate for learning languages. And particularly, of course, in New Zealand, it's, it's important that we understand a lot more about um, te reo and, and, and use it more commonly and use it appropriately. Yeah, completely. You know, like I've been really fortunate to work at Unitech and there's a really, a really big focus on Mataranga Māori in our, in the way that we teach and also just in the language that we use. And, and it certainly encouraged me to upskill over the last couple of years and, and they run free courses and stuff, which is great. And I mean, just before we jump on back into those questions, because I believe we got through two last time uh, we caught up, 
at the Nutrition Society conference last year was the first time that I did a mehi actually in Oh, cool. um, in a conference and I was more nervous about that than what I was talking to a bunch of nutritionists and peers and colleagues and mentors about smart carbohydrate diets for athletes it was the me here at the start and I was super nervous and I was the only one that did one actually which really surprised me which made me even more nervous because I was at the end of the first day I believe of that conference and I'm like mate Oh, but I got through it and it was good. And I felt really proud of myself, actually. Good on you. Thanks. <laughs> hey, um, so as you know from last time, um, we've got about 18 questions from really enthusiastic people who want to pick your brains about things. And in fact, not just you, but Bella as well. But unfortunately, she can't be here today, which is a real shame because it means it's just you and I. And we're going to miss her lovely presence and her little gems. But hopefully she can join us for the next one. She'll be back. She'll be back. Um, so we'll jump off back in to Paul's question. And Paul's just asked, this is Paul Kelly, actually. He asks a lot of great questions on my uh, Real Food Nutrition page. He's read Kate Shanahan's book, and she talks about the importance of liver. He's using a chicken liver pate as he can't stomach liver. And the ingredients seem fine. And he actually sent me through a picture of the ingredients. Um, and he just wanted to double check that it was a suitable replacement for actually just consuming liver by itself. Now, of course, you and I both know that you can buy pate and then you can buy pate, you know. So there's always going to be this uh, spectrum of kind of quality of ingredients and, and things like that. But the one that Paul is, is consuming is really, it's organic chicken livers, there's butter, there's um, herbs. And I believe that's pretty much it, actually. Yeah, I mean, great stuff. You know, I, I think uh, if you've ever made pate it's very simple to make um, it's not always simple to make it taste great but it's very <laughs> simple to make and um, it, it is very basic yeah it's basically just you know to tends, tends to be just the liver um, you know herbs or spices and you know sometimes a bit of wine or something like that which gets sort of reduced and cooked off and sometimes a little bit of added fat so yeah very very basic food um, mm -hmm. incredibly nutrient dense but I think where people are just looking for those very basic ingredients without you know fillers particularly the carbohydrate fillers not that the carbs are bad necessarily but they're just unnecessary in that and then you're sort of bulking it up with things that you don't necessarily need I think we're getting something that is just very basic um, mm. it's going to be a really good option and to, to be honest I mean it's probably I would say that beef liver or you know any liver capsules or powders are, are really there if you don't like eating organ meats yeah you know, or if you want to get in larger amounts for whatever reason that you wouldn't otherwise get from diet. But if you enjoy eating organ meats, that's obviously the, the first call is to go for food before supplements. Yeah, for sure. It's really interesting, actually. Like me and my mate Ash, we experience the same thing when we have liver, which isn't very often. I actually feel awesome. Like uh, if I just pan fry some liver and coconut oil and and even just a little bit of salt and pepper and not a lot of flavoring and have it. And I don't have a lot. Like as I understand it, you don't need a lot of liver each week, maybe 50 to 100 grams across the course of a week, say, if you were kind of looking at optimizing the nutrients that you'd get from liver, depending, of course, on everything else, uh, being kind of optimal, I suppose, or not getting overly pedantic or not having it from a therapeutic basis. Yeah. Um, but we are both, Ash and I are both like, man, I feel great when I have liver. That's cool. I haven't noticed that, but I certainly like eating organ meats. Yeah. It's, um, you know, what I also find with the whole pate thing is it's kind of coming back into the, um, the food scene a little bit with some people like, you know, food always tends to have, I guess, kind of seasons and, and what's popular and what's not. And a lot of what you see on menus these days are things around organ meats and offal and, and cuts yeah. of meat, which used to be super cheap from the butcher, which are now more high end products. Yeah. It's, it's super interesting. When I first got into the industry, probably, a, you know, similar to, to you, it was in the 1990s and we were really into bodybuilding and all sorts. And there was this idea that there had been a, a lot of people had used particularly beef liver 
beef liver capsules as a supplement for a long time. It was sort of an old um, physical culture thing to do. So a lot of the old bodybuilders and weightlifters and whatnot used to do that. Mm. And it really fell out of favor through, I guess, the 80s and 90s because people had this idea that it's sort of the, the detox organ. So why would you want to be taking something that's full of these toxic metabolites, which it's not, yes. um, or that could be dangerous for whatever reason, you know, cause foodborne infection problems, which of course it, it doesn't really either. And um, so it fell out of favor, but it was interesting. It was this real mindset around cleanliness. You know, mm. you wanted to have clean foods and you didn't want to take organ meats and you wanted to take all the fat off your meats and all this kind of stuff. And we've now redressed that to a large degree where people are going back to, to eating nose to tail, yeah. eating whole foods, even if that's, you know, whole animal based foods and consequently getting a whole lot more nutrient density because, you know, you and I would both agree. I'm sure there's no good reason to, to ditch a whole bunch of the animal when it's so mm. nutrient dense. And there's certainly yeah. no reason to, to strip off healthy, you know, vitamin transporting fat off meat either. So uh, I think it's been really positive. The only downside to it is, as you said, I used to be able to pick up beef cheek for three ninety nine a kilo and now it's really expensive. <laughs> Yeah, I know, right? Like I went into Ferret the other day to have a look and I think it was like $23 for like four of them. Like it certainly kind of puts it out of the price range or price bracket for a lot of people who are just looking to kind of do, you know, to, to eat in a way which um, is that nose to tail type way. The great thing yeah. with liver, it's actually pretty cheap. Even those kind of organic chicken livers that you can pick up from the supermarket are not kind of really that cost prohibitive i don't think yeah we we usually wait till they're on clearance or yeah you know because often on the, the clearance stuff there's still quite a lot of lag time it's just yeah. because they've obviously ordered too much or there's been a bit of a run on it because people are you know all geared up on organ meat ideas and yeah. they don't actually end up doing anything so yeah we wait till that clearance comes out and then um yeah we just stock up tell you what my favorite aisle in the supermarket is that reduce for quick sale aisle particularly in the dairy section which I know is different from the meat section which we were talking about but I'm always stalking that reduce for quick sale because you can totally pick up a bargain absolutely mm. yeah. and just for people who are unfamiliar with Kate Shanahan just um and I know Cliff you'll know all about Kate I heard her at a ancestral health conference a few years ago she's got a couple of books now and, and her first book that came out was called Deep Nutrition I think and she was a she's a physician actually but she was also consulting to I want to say the Lakers on their um not only medical but on their kind of nutrition related protocols and this was back in maybe 2014 2015 I think that's where she kind of got that's where she became popularized if you like so obviously huh. Paul's reading her book all about the you know the whole real food and moving away from the real processed food type stuff and clearly taking on board some good tips which is great sounds like it yeah hey um so Caroline Bus, she's asked, um, should I be taking a probiotic every day? I currently take Garden of Life once daily, woman's probiotic, but read recently that it's not good for gut health to take them daily. What's your views? It's a really good question. Um, I've got a bit of a chronology, I guess, in how I have viewed probiotics. Mm. Um, I, I used to be very much of the opinion that they were they were there sort of to sort of kickstart gut health and that's how we'd often use them particularly in naturopathy back in the day we'd have this idea of you you uh weed seed and feed mm. right so the, the weeding is basically a lot while a lot of people would use really aggressive detox protocols that's not really what i was into it's more about getting someone eating a good diet on balance first to help to sort of help to sort of kick start that microbiome change then to seed is to basically provide probiotics and particularly a lot of the, the sort of early stage probiotics like um, like lactobacillus ruteri mm -hmm. and some of the others that are really early, early sort of colonizers. And then to really transition just into feeding the microbiome with the, the best substrate. So having, mm -hmm. you know, lots of fibers and resistant starches, short chain and medium chain fats and all, all that kind of stuff, fish oils, uh, which will help to either feed the microbiome or to help redress dysbiosis. Mm. I probably have changed a little bit in that mentality because I, I wasn't really a fan of long-term probiotic use and I'm still not. 
the reason being that I think a lot of the probiotics that we get are maybe that while they might have benefits, even if they're dead, they're not mm. necessarily that viable. Mm. Um, they might be limited in terms of the spectra of bacteria that are used. And in some cases, the bacteria that are used may not be good for an individual yeah. because there's going to be different microbiome signatures for basically every person and every even every condition. So we see similarities in people with particular conditions that are different to say healthy controls. So when you have those differences, you can't always just apply the same thing. Mm. However, there's a bit of a caveat to that in that there are certain bacteria for which, or for, for whom most people respond really well to. So, and they're the basics, you know, they're the basics of, um, you know, your acidophilus bacteria, you know, your, um, most of your lactobacillus species, you know, your, your bifidobacteria and stuff like that. So there, there are certain ones that if people want to uh, look into that a little bit more, I have done a, a pretty big research review on it, looking at those most common bacteria that are, are sort of conducive to people's gut health overall. So there are certain things that we can take, but I don't necessarily think that we should be taking high dose probiotics every day because it's probably unnecessary. We're probably okay taking, um, either just more fermented foods in relatively mm. small amounts, but consistently maybe varying that. And I know some people won't respond well to fermented foods either, but that's a case by case basis. Most people probably do respond quite well um, or sort of broad spectrum symbiotics, I think are, are pretty beneficial as well. Mm. So that probably didn't answer the question that much, but I guess the, the short end of the log story is that I'm not, I don't think it's necessary to take, high dose targeted probiotics for a long period of time yeah no that's good and and it's really interesting like the whole probiotic versus prebiotic and also what what a healthy gut requires you know I really liked how you picked up that how you mentioned I'm sorry not picked up that you know everyone is really individual as to what their gut is going to tolerate and, and what they might require. And I think there are a couple of schools of thought. And one is that we need to take probiotics in order to be healthy and get those bacteria that our gut microbiome needs, particularly if you're lacking in something. But it's super difficult to know what you're lacking in because just because you give, you take a probiotic doesn't mean that it's going to um, seed and in fact, or colonize. And it appears that actually there was something that came out last week or the week before that potentially some things do colonize, but usually they just kind of pass through and change the gut microbiome is as I understand it. But then you've also got people who think that probiotics are completely useless and there's no point taking them and, and all you need to do is kind of get them from food. The whole thing around diet and the gut microbiome, I think is such an interesting question, particularly if we think about, and I'm totally going on a tangent here, and this is not what Caroline asked, but it did make me think about it, um, is, you know, the whole, the carnivore um, diet, the ketogenic yeah. diet, a vegan diet, people with, you know, um, who have irritable bowel, like all of these things are going to create a different environment in the gut. And I think in my, like, in, as, a, as I understand it, we just don't really, no one can say for sure what you require for a healthy gut and possibly the only way we determine that is actually looking at other health indicators in and around overall health because so much of our health is reliant on having a gut microbiome that's kind of optimal yeah it's it's a really good point and it it makes it far more nuanced because we do see different microbiome signatures between for example like i mentioned different conditions and that, that's important to recognize but when we also see different microbiome signatures associated with different diets, it doesn't necessarily mean that a diet is bad because it reduces, say, diversity, mm. right? Well, we'd usually say that that's a bad thing. We don't necessarily know that unless we can see functional endpoints that, that basically prove that. Yeah. So unless we can see negative outcomes for health, then we can't, by definition, say that a change is a, a negative thing. And this is often the case with a lot of things that we look at in, in science, we'll see a change in morphology or a change in sort of structure and function within a particular organ, let's say. And people will say, well, it's damaged, but a change isn't necessarily positive, negative or neutral. We can only determine that by the outcome. Mm. And it's, it's interesting what you say 
and I've come across this a lot when people say, well, probiotics are useless. And I think that would be a very disingenuous thing to say if we look at the research, because there, there is sufficient evidence to show that various probiotics will result in positive health outcomes. Mm. So that in itself tells us that probiotics aren't useless, but it doesn't mean that they should be a blanket for everyone either. Um, a lot of the, I think, the, the well, two things, the, the two things can't be true either. Yeah. That, well, probiotics are useless. Therefore, we should just get bacteria from food because if probiotics are viable and bacteria from food is viable, then those two things can't be true. Yeah. Right. But then the argument is, well, probiotics aren't viable. Now that, that that's a whole different question and it relies on a supposition that bacteria need to be alive in order to have a function and that probiotics are not alive or are not viable. Yeah. So if we address that conversation, we'll, we'll basically have two outcomes, right? That some probiotics are not that viable. Mm. Uh, uh, most of them, in fact, are dead and they're not going to be, become reactivated, but they might still have an effect because the, the immune system and the epithelial cells of the gut and the sort of gut to immune transfer is basically reading those as signaling molecules mm. and so there's going to be some potential outcome there but what we also need to consider is some bacteria are viable for example the um, some of the bacillus species like bacillus coagulans is incredibly viable you can uh, freeze dry that and take it a year later in a boiling a, a drink made with boiling water you can put it in a tea made with boiling water Mm -hmm. And it will be 95% of those bacteria will be viable. Wow. So it's got incredibly high viability and it survives the acid environment of the stomach. Yeah. So certain bacteria are very resilient. Mm. Some are not, but there can still be benefits. Yeah. To circle back to probably the most important thing though, in the research that I've read and the, the reviews and meta-analyses of the research, it seems to be that if you had to take one or the other, prebi more prebiotics versus more probiotics, you'd probably go for more prebiotics. So in other words, the things that feed the bacteria are yeah. likely to be way more important for preserving a, a better biosis status. Yeah. Yeah, it's super interesting, eh? Like you often see out there in um, social media and you hear other health professionals talk about the negative impact that a ketogenic diet has on our gut microbiome because it reduces down the amount of bifidobacterium, which is one of the major species in our gut, which is often associated is completely associated with a healthy gut microbiome i was looking at one paper just quite recently that showed that despite that reduction or in addition to that reduction in bifidobacterium there was an uptick in our body's antioxidant ability to or antioxidant system so our own i think it was the um i'm going to say glutathione or glutathione mm. antioxidant i think that was uptick either yeah. that or another one Typical me cannot remember the finer detail, but also there was an increase in the amount of short chain fatty acids that were produced in that ketogenic diet as well, which is important from a kind of a gut resiliency, um, gut mucus kind of perspective. So it's just really difficult. Like you can't blanket say that one particular diet is, is harmful um, just across the board. We often see short term changes that aren't as profound as the long-term effects either. So there's often a rebound. And I remember reading a paper on that and on the ketogenic diet, the, they had studied the ketogenic diet in shorter studies. And when they started looking longer term, there was quite a big rebound whereby there was a, a sort of balancing effect. Yeah. So I, I don't doubt that there would be some change in microbiome status because you would assume that that's going to happen when you have a change in the substrate that's available. Mm. But again, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad thing. And so we really need to look as you suggested at the, the end points, what's actually happening outside of just the, the change, but also within the gut, what's happening? You know, is it a reduction in diversity? Is it a redu reduction in total numbers? Um, you know, what does that actually mean according to the various taxa, you know, phyla, genus level microbiome? Mm. Because that can be quite different. And within particular uh, genera we, we can see quite different effects of certain bacteria as well so you might have certain bifidobacteria that are considered on balance to be more positive or more positive in a particular condition 
and others, even within supposedly healthy families of bacteria. I know I'm mixing up my class, family, genera, order, species, all that kind of stuff, but don't, don't worry about that. Um, you know, within different types of bacteria, you can see subtly different things in different people. So we probably just don't know enough to really say, um, but we do have enough functional endpoint evidence to suggest that there are some probiotics that will be on balance, probably better for health. Yeah. And that on balance as well, a nutrient dense diet that has, you know, carnivore notwithstanding, that generally has relatively decent levels of fiber and resistant starch, bioflavonoids and other chemicals from plants. And then other things that are really important as well, like I think omega-3 fats are critically important for proper biosis. Mm. And most people don't even think about them. No. To the point where I did a little research review on it and there's quite a lot of research. It's pretty cool stuff. Yeah. And I, I checked it out on social and um, I had to block someone on LinkedIn because every article I put up, they'd basically say, what are you talking about? This is bullshit. And they, okay. they said that about fish oil. They're like, fish oil has nothing to do with the gut. Fish oil is responsible for all these effects on systemic inflammation, all this kind of stuff. It's like, did you read the article? I have like 20 <laughs> references there, you know, read the studies. Mate, I had no idea about that, about omega-3. So I'm certainly going to have a look at that because I love those little tidbits and stuff. I found I'm, I'm not going to go off on the tangent of muscle protein synthesis and omega-3 fatty acids, but um, I think that that could definitely be a topic for another day because that's kind of, it's almost like they're, they're so ingrained in us that we need our omega-3s that people kind of don't even know why we take them anymore. It's one of those things that we've always done. In the gut, it's really interesting because most people look at lipids as being a, a marker of a healthy gut. Yeah. So, you know, you've got more butyrate, which is short chain fatty acid. That means you've probably got a better microbiomal status. You've got more of those, um, you know, bifidobacteria that are ten tend to be butyrogenic, all that kind of stuff. What people don't generally think of is that lipids are really important also for feeding the gut and preserving mm -hmm. the optimal inflammatory status of the gut. And people tend to focus just, just on fiber and resistant starch. But like I say, fish oils are really important for preventing and, and reversing dysbiosis, as are some other things like medium chain triglycerides. Medium chain triglycerides are really uh, effective for that. And particularly for some outcomes like candida, they're really effective for helping, helping to treat candida. So do you think then from a candida perspective, something like a... a or I'm going to say low carb, but even potentially a ketogenic diet or including these ketogenic type foods in our diet. Is that a recommendation you would make for someone who has candida? And I, I get confused with the gut. I get frustrated with gut microbiome testing, with people coming to me and saying that they've got this overgrowth as measured by X, Y, Z, because it's just so difficult to know, to trust yeah. like a lot of those um, kind of test results. Um, I, I agree. I think a lot of the tests are probably fairly inconclusive and that's just be, that they haven't been validated correctly. Yeah. So, you know, you need reliability and you need validity. So you need the validity as, as shown that it, it actually works yeah. for, for testing what you want and that it's reliable. You can basically repeat that and you're going to get, you know, consistent results. And we, we often don't have that reliability and validity. Um, but the bigger problem is that a lot of people are diagnosed with you know, various aspects of dysbiosis, whether it be C, uh, SIBO, or whether it be a candida overgrowth or whatever, not by testing, but by, by questionnaire. Yeah. And that's really problematic because you know, depending on what you want to see out of a questionnaire, you'll see anything you want. Like the questionnaires for chronic fatigue and candida overgrowth and um, some of the questionnaires people use for SIBO or for all sorts of other things, they're basically the same thing. Mm. So what, what do you actually have? We don't yeah. know. So yeah, I think totally. I think candida overgrowth is massively over-diagnosed in complementary medicine as well. Yeah, interesting. So if I just go back to that initial question, um, which isn't the initial one that Caroline asked, but just about the ketogenic diet and candida, is that something that you would recommend for someone? Yeah, I think a, a low-carb diet certainly... I think could really help. You know, avoiding sugars and all of the the sort of fast digesting starches, I think is, is a really good idea. So a low carb or ketogenic diet approach is, is really helpful. I think particularly so when that includes a lot of fish oil, um, you know, fairly high amounts of MCTs. And then there's a whole 
range of, of herbals and things that can also help as well. I actually did a, um, a big research review on that too, Mickey, which I can yeah. send through to you. Yeah, I did a, um, an issue of my monthly research review on Candida. Mate, I am so behind on what you do because you are just prolific in that space. Almost every time I go on Twitter, I'm seeing something new that you've put out and I always retweet it. And I do that in part so I can share it with everyone because I don't doubt that it's quality, but also so I've actually got it in my history, in my feed, so I can go back and have a look at later and I maybe get back to it like 20% of the time. Cliff, I'll have to sign you up so you get the the reviews. Oh, can you? That'd be awesome. (laughs) Um, So actually, if we just go back to Caroline's question then, I guess in summary, there's nothing harmful to take a probiotic every day, um, but it might not be necessary. Is that kind of the guts of it? Absolutely. And I think if you, if you were getting any serious, you know, negative effect in terms of dysbiosis from it, you'd probably feel it. Yeah. And so there's also nothing wrong with going off something for a while. Mm. You know, I I often recommend that to, to clients if they don't, if they don't know if they're getting benefit from something, because we often don't know, there can be a bit of a slow build. We often see this with a really good multi. You know, I'm not sure if it's really giving me benefit. Well, I say, well, we'll go off for a couple of weeks. Yeah. And that's typically when people, if it is providing benefit, will notice something. And, yeah, you know, so if, some, if someone was taking a probiotic regularly and it wasn't giving them any negative effect, but they weren't really sure if it was of benefit, they could go off it for a couple of weeks. And if they started to notice any negative effects, then they could just jump back on. Yeah, nice. I uh, I follow someone called Dr. Michael Ruscio, and he's got this great book called Healthy Gut, Healthy You. And I came across him on the kind of Chris Cresser type podcasts and Rob Wolf. And he talks about the different classes of probiotics and Caroline is taking garden of life. And it's actually one which I quite like on the basis of what Dr. Ruscio talks about with regards to the type of probiotics. So you've got the soil based organisms, yeah, which we don't tend to have much of like, I think if they've, if people think about where they get their probiotics from, that's one that might not necessarily be in, in, in abundance. You've got your lactobacillus bifidobacterium type bacterias, mm-hmm. but then you've got your not quite bacteria at all, actually, um, the Saccharomyces boulardii, so the yeast. Right. And he suggests that if someone has an, has like starts taking a probiotic and they're getting some kind of negative feedback from it, some bloating, some, some gas or other gut dysbiosis from the probiotic, it might mean actually that they might already have enough of that probiotic. So your whole kind of weeding, you know, not really requiring it, even though it's good for you. So you'd get off that probiotic and maybe try another different class of probiotic that might actually be more beneficial. Yeah, and I don't know if this is correct or not, but I do remember having a chat with a couple of gut health experts. I don't want to to say who they are just in case I'm misquoting them, but I remember uh, discussing the the yeast, like the um, Mm. uh, the saccharomyces. Saccharomyces, yeah. Um, And there's a couple of different saccharomyces that can be used in probiotics. And the idea was that those are often best used for a short term and they tend to be now this could just be their impression i'm not sure but they tend to be some of the ones that can uh cause some issues for people if they're used for too long yeah interesting now, again i don't know if that's 100 percent accurate i haven't seen that in, in my reading of the research but that was coming from people that i respect as yeah. sort of gut health experts so that, that's an interesting one Totally. And I think it's just, it really does come back to the individual, right? And it's the same for, for anything that how you know, you'll know pretty quickly whether something's agreeing with you or not. And I certainly liked what you uh, suggested, Cliff, of coming off it of anything like a vitamin, like a probiotic, and to see whether there is any detrimental impact of that. Because it really does come down to that kind of N equals one, you are your own best investigator. So how you respond is is probably the most important thing and not what Mickey or Cliff has to say about a particular probiotic or um, actual, yeah. actual experts in the field, not just us putting our spin on it. Yeah, yeah humans are resilient. Like we yeah. often get hooked on our supplements and we think, oh no, if I don't have my, it's, we, we think of it like a life-saving medication. If mm-hmm. I don't have my multi today, I'm going to feel terrible. No, you won't, you'll be fine. <laughs> you know, total. It's, it's all stuff that we take for a particular purpose but with the exception of oxygen and water there's not much that we require really i quite like food well we need food but we don't need it all the time and you can go for a lot you can go months without food 
mate. Imagine going months <laughs> without food. <laughs> that would be a miserable existence. Interesting when people, you know, I, I um, see people on social media almost high-fiving each other because they're down to OMAD or one meal a day or, you know, um, one meal every second day, God forbid. And I just, I kind of think, and, this is, and again, this is personal. This is just for me. But yeah. I really enjoy eating and I look forward to my meals. <clears throat> And I would be pretty miserable if I did that kind of fasting, which is, I mean, one, I wouldn't do an extended fast because my body type doesn't lend itself well to probably having any real favorable outcomes. And if anything, I'll probably just go massively catabolic, which wouldn't be helpful. Yeah. It's just the whole, everything around food is pretty, for the most part, delicious. So, yeah. We tend to lord outliers. You know, mm. we, we, we lord outliers or outlier ideals you know i think it's really interesting that we've had medically supervised fasts that go for over a year yes it's super interesting right and i've i've had clients for whom a long and i'm talking months long fast has been really beneficial because they've been able to lose a lot of the, the weight they need to lose for health yep. reasons you know these are people who are at the extreme end of obesity mm. and it's helped to break their habituation to food patterns yeah so there's been some real positives yeah however for some people it wouldn't be a positive because that would actually be a negative food habit to be trying to to be so extreme with the fasting so there's a big yeah. difference you know the same thing can be really different in terms of its uh, psychological and behavioral outcomes for two different people yeah and yet we tend to to lord this idea that oh well, you're down to one meal a day that's fantastic I would say, well, you're down to one meal a day. That's fantastic if it's working for you. Yeah. Because there's a lot of people for whom it wouldn't work. And, you know, we've talked about this before. I had a really good discussion about this with our mutual friend, associate, uh, Claire Badenhorst, the other day uh, about the idea that we have in society that because we have the diabetes epidemic, most things are geared towards getting people to eat less. Mm. But what about those people? And I suspect, and we'll do some research on this, but I suspect about 20% of people are drastically under eat. Yeah, yeah. Habitually, right? So for yeah. them, as you alluded to, it wouldn't be a good idea to try and go to one meal a day or one meal every two days. Completely. But and it's really interesting what you say about, you know, the same behavior will have different psychological outcomes, you know, positive and negative, because I just know my, my personality type is 100% on that restrictive side. So if someone tells me not to do something, it's, I find it incredibly easy to not mm. do it. And it's not, and that's not necessarily a good thing. If I think about alcohol, for example, I have friends who recognize that their alcohol intake was, you know, had negative outcomes on just the kind of day to day. And, and I'm not, and this was by no means that, that it was any kind of like addictive uh, kind of alcoholism in the sense of they were alcoholic, but they just noticed that their, you know, their mood wasn't great. They, they were gaining weight. It affected their eating behavior and it actually just didn't make them feel very good. So they decided to go alcohol free for a period of time, like, you know, the dry July or um, uh, I can't remember what February is called, but often that's also used as a, a time of kind of abstaining. Um, but for me, that would be a terrible idea, actually. And I know that sounds like, and it's not just because I enjoy a wine, because I do, but it's just too easy to restrict and so yeah. I, it's yeah, good point. easy for me to find a balance. So if I find balance, I like to try and keep it, even if, and I'm not suggesting that I force myself to drink every week because I know that I, <laughs> if I didn't, then that would be bad. But it just the way that it fits into my lifestyle is just really easy and it it has a lot of positive benefits rather than um, any kind of negative um, outcomes. Yeah. And just just to clarify, I'm not a massive drinker <laughs> in case you think I am. That is not what I'm suggesting. I'm, yeah. I'm a massive drinker. I have probably about six light beers a week. Six Maybe. Light. Yeah. Do you know, I just, um, Less. <laughs> I had my first G&T actually of the season uh, in the weekend because summer cliff. Yeah. It's nice. It's getting better. But I think it's really interesting what you mentioned about the under eating. And I think that that whole metabolic adaptation idea and, and I was listening to Eric who I'm about to catch up with in a couple of days time and he doesn't look at it from this metabolic adaptation 
perspective the way that you know people are oh he looks at it more from an energy kind of adaptation rather than a metabolic adaptation is how he describes it the way he just talks about it same thing but there's a slight nuance to the way that he kind of discusses it so i'll be really interested to kind of hear you know his take on it because he's a you know he's just as smart as you basically so it'll be super interesting probably smarter he's and he's got a really good perspective on i mean in terms of metabolic adaptation to diet eric's done a lot more work in that space but particularly with respect to the functional outcomes like yeah my area has obviously been very much embedded in what's happening with our metabolic machinery when we change what we're eating mm. um, but obviously with his focus being performance and, and various performance aspects he's seen both firsthand but also been you know very in with the research on on what actually happens as a result of of energy restriction yeah yeah for sure and I do love how you can kind of take that physique science it's almost like those are those outliers and those extremes that we're talking about in terms of kind of what they put their body through to get them to this particular outcome but from a kind of a a health perspective and a gen pop perspective we can learn a lot of lessons from that and it's quite nice to see that the things which that have been witnessed in bro science for so many years are coming into laboratories and being studied actually Absolutely. I had that conversation with a colleague the other day. I sent them Eric's paper on evidence-based recommendations for natural bodybuilding because we were discussing, um, we were having a little debate about how much protein is required. And yeah. this this person thought much less. And I thought, you know, we should probably go at the higher end. Um, I sent him him that as some sort of supporting evidence and obviously he sort of came back and said well what about real people and I was like dude w- what we're looking at with natural bodybuilders is people who are not pharmaceutically enhanced and they're putting themselves in a state of calorie restriction now no doubt they're also doing a lot of exercise but if we look at what we are trying to achieve with people who are losing body fat there's no better population to study than a population who do that as basically what they do yeah yeah (laughs) all they're about is losing the body fat right and trying to retain as much muscle as possible so if we're trying to retain as much muscle as possible in a client who's trying to lose body fat then it gives us a pretty good metric for how much protein they should be taking in Absolutely. And it's super interesting how we try and delineate between athlete and gen pop. And of course, it's absolutely appropriate if we're talking performance. But if we're talking health, you know, the same fundamental things apply. And we almost don't give credit to gen pop in terms of what they actually do on a day to day basis, because general population is out there doing F45 six times a week, but then going to work and then running a household and then um, I don't know, might might even, you know, there are a heap of people who are just your general average person who might even train twice a day. Yep. So, I know I, I know recreational athletes who train six times more than some world champion athletes I know of. Right. And so who who's the athlete? It yeah. it, it really comes down to energy balance at that mm-hmm. point. Mm-hmm. There's other things, obviously, there's the micronutrient status, all those various other things, but it, just in terms of this stuff particularly with metabolic adaptation to diet, then it does come down to that energy balance or energy adaptation. And there's another point to that as well, which I think is really important. We differentiate between athletes and non-athletes, and we think that what they should be doing is completely different. But as you and I have discussed, and you know that talk I gave at Agnum, uh, where we both spoke, was, was all about the idea that performance is built on a foundation of health. Yeah. But not just that, it's also like a reverse causation thing where humans have evolved to be active. Mm -hmm. So if you want to thrive, and it's your choice if you don't want to, that's completely cool. But if someone does want to thrive, the reality is that you're going to be active, you're going to sleep well, and you're going to eat. Yeah. And you're going to eat natural unrefined foods. Yeah. That's it. So you're basically an athlete, irrespective, because we are you know a a natural living human as an athlete if you walk for massive distances and you occasionally sprint and chase things or run away from things climb trees and drag shit around you're a freaking athlete 
Yeah, you are. But you know what, Cliff? Not a lot of people do that in real life. And it's not because they've not evolved to do that. It's because their real life doesn't lend itself to dragging things around, sprinting, climbing. Instead, it's the, the, they climb from the, uh, they climb out of their car up to their office or jump on the yeah. couch or they might lift something heavy, but it might be something from the fridge to the couch. Like I like, like, and <laughs> so I'm going to be the a hole though because I'm going to say, well, that's fine if you want to survive, but if you want to thrive, that's when we make choices, right? Look, look, totally. And I'm going to be the a hole <laughs> by saying that I look. Sometimes I find myself, and I don't mean to, but I might be just observing people in a punk public space, and I literally kind of have this almost head spin of how on earth has this happened? Like how I'm looking at these humans, and how is it that this is what I'm looking at and this is how people are living their lives. Like it's just a really unnatural thing. And look, I'm by no means suggesting that I live this perfect athlete, you know, human athlete life at all. We both know that, you know, I'm not perfect and no one is perfect, but I often think, how has it come to this? Basically when I'm thinking about human health, how has it come to this? Yeah. Which is quite different from uh, where we started with this conversation, which is about probiotics. (laughs) Which is what, you that, know what? That's what happens. That's what happens when we get together and we talk. Um, I am just going to move on because I, we probably have time for hopefully a couple more. Um, Jason Smith would be interested in your thoughts on protein intake and ketosis. He's used two grams per kg body weight, generally for maintenance, but is thinking of going keto and has been recommended one to 1.5 grams. Is that enough protein? He's concerned that a past problem with delayed onset muscle soreness or DOMS might reappear if he drops his protein intake too low. So Cliff, you are New Zealand's expert in ketogenesis, ketosis, Dr. Cliff Harvey, PhD. What's your take? Thanks, Mickey. Given that we did a lot of our research together, I think you can take some of that as as well. But uh, you know, I think that the fear around protein in ketosis is completely unjustified. Mm. The, the fear typically comes from one of two angles. One is that when we take in more protein, amino acids from that protein are going to, going to be converted to glucose. So there's going to be a sort of anti-ketogenic effect because of that. The other idea is that because there is an insulin response to, to protein, that that is going to suppress ketosis. But on balance, we'd say neither of those things are really that important for achieving functional ketosis. Mm. You're going to achieve ketosis on a relatively high protein diet. Now, in terms of gluconeogenesis, so the the insulin response thing is interesting because while there there is an insulin response, typically there's not the same sustained insulin release in response to protein. So you don't get the sort of biphasic releases and things. Um, Overall, if we look at insulin homeostasis, when people eat a higher di- higher protein diet, generally their insulin homeostasis is better and their blood sugar control is better. Mm-hmm. When we look at gluconeogenesis or the creation of glucose from from protein in particular, we can convert um, you know glycerol from from fat as well into glucose. But predominantly, we're talking about glucose creation from the amino acids from protein. We need to consider a really important thing: it's predominantly demand driven, not supply driven. Okay. What that means is by taking in more protein, we're not going to necessarily create a whole bunch more glucose. Yeah. So the glucose that we're creating in the body, we're creating because we require it. So it's a good thing. Gluconeogenesis is really feared in ketogenic diets or in low carb circles, but it needn't be because we need a certain amount of glucose. Yeah. And it's fine. The body will create that. So given that there's not a lot of fear, I always take the position we should optimize protein first, mm-hmm. irrespective of the diet. It doesn't matter whether it's keto, low carb, moderate carb, high carb, you optimize protein first. And I personally think that one to 1.5 grams of protein per kilo body weight per day is too low. I yeah. think people need to have a minimum of 1.4 grams to preserve performance. Mm-hmm. And then people say, well, I'm not an athlete. And I say, well, it doesn't matter because you are an athlete. You're in an athlete's body because that's what a human is, just like we talked about. Yeah. So 1.4 grams protein per day, being the minimum. And I would probably say if, um, you know, the the person asking the question is typically eating two grams per day anyway, don't change that. That's perfect. Yeah. That's exactly the amount that I would generally recommend. And it won't negatively affect your, your outcomes from a keto diet at all. 
Yeah, super interesting as well, because Jason talks about DOMS, right? Delayed onset muscle soreness, which totally suggests to me that he is an active individual and someone who, you know, is doing something that's going to create that muscle damage at the end of whatever it is that he does will definitely require that um, higher protein intake. And, um, and there is research to show that DOMS is reduced by optimizing your protein intake. Totally. And in fact, you know, and I came across this whilst I, because I've been, jumping on the BCAAs in the last few months. And there's good research to show that they actually help recover you from DOMS more so than, uh, or not more so than anything else, but actually just that that's part of the efficacy, the branched chain mm. amino acids helping reduce DOMS. Yep. Yeah. And one other th interesting thing, uh, Cliff, about protein, which hopefully Jason will find interesting because obviously he is an athlete because he is human um, and possibly <laughs> active, um, is that you know, I had this kind of lingering ham hamstring tendinopathy, which had been hanging around probably for a good 18 months up until about maybe June or something this year, where I actually, where I bumped up my training for the baby ultra that I did so a 50k that I've just done a couple of weeks ago and so I really took quite a serious look at my energy intake and my macro intake and making sure that I was fueling to meet my demands because as I mentioned in that previous question you know it's very easy for me to restrict and as an endurance athlete I'm certainly think that I would fall in the under eating category rather than you know any other kind of category so I've really made a good effort to help support my training and in part with the protein, I've really lifted it up. So I'm having, you know, upwards of 130 grams of protein a day and I actually find it super easy to do and really enjoyable because I really enjoy eating it. But despite the fact that my training lifted and the in intensity of some sessions increased along with the volume, my tendinopathy has completely cleared up. Interesting. Yeah. And I think it is in part due to that higher protein load. Now, I've also had a client who, for various reasons, is following a carnivore approach, which is something that I've worked for, with her for a year. And we've decided that we are doing this based on her individual situation. And, you know, she's really open and I'm really open to exploring what changes she might um, experience from doing it. So bear that in mind when I'm saying that, I'm not at all suggesting that a carnivore approach is for everyone at all. But she also has had a hamstring tendinopathy, which after two weeks of, of following a carnivore approach has completely resolved itself. And this is literally after we've been working together for a year and she's had ongoing issues in that time. And it was prior to that it was something that she was kind of dealing with so mm. I think in part with with both of our situation is that increase in protein increase in animal protein as well interesting yeah so don't go low on protein basically don't go low on protein no um okay so this is another one from Paul which is great hey Mickey I have heard you mention perfect keto MCT powder which flavor do you go for and how would you apply it in a fasted training protocol? Does it mix well with coffee? Presume it would be natural flavor then. Um, cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Cheers. So, um, so I'll tell you, Cliff, how I like to use MCT powder. And then I'm actually interested, I don't know that you actually use it, so I'll be interested to, to hear um, your experience with it. But with a lot of clients who I work with, I and um, Paul talks about quote unquote fasted training. And I typically with athletes, we I use the term fasted, I suppose a little bit loosely in that I sometimes mean it to be no calories, but I sometimes mean it to be fasted from glucose or fasted from carbohydrate. So we're keeping that insulin response low, heading yeah. into a training session. And that just provides uh, an athlete with the ability to hopefully get um kind of increase fat oxidation levels. And also from a kind of cellular level, you get an increased expression of genes that help with those endurance adaptations. So that's one of the reasons why entering some training sessions in that fasted state can be really beneficial. But it's yeah. not always appropriate to be low calorie. And so if you are someone who struggles to meet your energy requirements, this is when I am quite a fan of introducing calories pre-session 
that aren't glucose. And that's where this uh, MCT powder comes in for me. I typically use Quest MCT powder. So it's one that Dom D'Agostino um, has in the past used. So that's how I kind of jumped on board that bandwagon and, and I can get it from iHerb. You can get it in New Zealand from, I believe, Mighty Ape, but honestly, it costs almost double than mm. getting direct from iHerb. And another one that I like and that I purchased was Perfect Keto MCT, which was salted caramel flavor. And what I've been doing, actually, or what I have in the past, is kind of made a this is, I haven't used that pre-training because as Paul suggests, when I, you know, I like to have it in coffee. So I just put like a tablespoon of the MCT powder, natural flavor in coffee, tastes a little bit like coconut, pretty delicious. Instead with the salted caramel um, MCT powder, I've actually popped it in my breakfast smoothie bowl. And so I've got protein powder, the MCT powder, ice, might put some carrot or zucchini or almond milk, blend all that together. And it actually turns into this big, thick, creamy deliciousness, which I know Cliff, I don't think you call that food, but. Um, I hate smoothie bowls. I love, I lo do you know what? I've got to say, I am a big fan of those <clears throat> fluffy smoothie bowls. They've yeah, been a bit of a game changer actually. Um, so yeah, that's why, that's how I use the MCT oil powder. And I will just, before I hand the microphone over to you, Cliff, just remind the listeners of, of why we'd use MCTs. And of course you are the expert in this space as well, but as I understand it, it's going, we don't readily store medium chain triglycerides. And so they become this readily available fuel source and they help our body produce ketones and that um, breakdown of, of fat when we use fat for energy. Exactly. So do you use MCT powder, Cliff? I mostly use MCT oil mm. um, just because it's, you know, by, by volume, it's cheaper. Um, I think that there is a bit of a difference in how tolerable it is, but I don't think that difference is as big as some people say. Mm. And the, the reason I say that is that if you're taking, say, a tablespoon of MCT powder, you're generally getting about half of it as fat content or less, and the rest is the, the carrier. And yes. some of the carriers are crap, you know, multidextrin, glucose powder, whatever. And so that's not really conducive to what we're looking for. Um, but most of the good companies nowadays use a, a gum arabic or some type of fiber. Yeah. So if it's just fiber, it's completely fine. But for that reason, I generally use the oil because I know that a tablespoon is a tablespoon. I don't need to take two tablespoons of MCT powder or more to get the same volume yeah good having said that um and i often use mixed ones depending on what i'm trying to do so i have a whole range right i'll have um short chain shorter chain mcts for sometimes and other times i'll have like a high um, dha mct that i'll use for for my brain um, i use really high dose fish oils as well that's a bit of an aside but yes i do use mct powders but only if i'm ever having it in coffee or tea yeah and um, it's just because of the mixability. And so, yeah. yes, I do, um, but I'm not drinking coffee at the moment. So I, and any type of coffee, even decaf. So I, I'm using it less and less, but yeah, I do occasionally use it and I do dig it. There's actually a paper just came out on the effect of MCTs in coffee. Oh. And I haven't had a good chance to look at it, but my understanding, I haven't even looked at the paper at all, but my understanding of the paper is that it does show that there is an increase in ketone production when you have MCTs in coffee. Now that makes complete sense because if you have just coffee alone, it will increase ketone production. Yeah. So I, what I don't know at this stage, because I haven't read the paper yet, but I will, is whether the effect is additive or cumulative or whether it's additive or synergistic. Yeah, interesting. Because as I understood it, and I'm, and I'm going to get um, the flavonoids in coffee confused, I'm sure, but they that, that having the coffee with the MCT helps helps get the the flavonoids or the phytochemicals across the blood brain barrier. Is that what you understand? So it helps with the effect of the phytochemicals in the brain. Is that something that you've heard before, or have I made this up? Which is highly possible. You probably haven't made it up. It's just not something I've heard. Well, I, they many of those plant compounds are actually fat soluble, and so having the lipid with them helps to absorb them into the body. Yeah, but I'm not sure about transport within the body. Okay, do you know Cliff? This I think we'll have. To I wouldn't have thought that it would. Oh, it could help. No, that's an it's an, it's an interesting one. 
Usually yeah. fats wouldn't play a role in that because obviously most fats being bound, bound to albumin, they don't get mm -hmm. into the brain very effectively. Some do, but not, you know, almost none do. Um, but obviously MCTs being easily transported across the blood brain barrier, maybe there is some co-opting there. I'm not sure. That's a really interesting one. I think that we will probably have to, um, if you're all right with this, um, because I have a feeling this is going to be a bit of a Mickey and Cliff series, um, actually come on for a dedicated discussion around MCTs and potentially your research in that space because everyone is super interested and we give snippets which I love getting little nuggets of information but I, I also know that a lot of, of people like me like to actually understand things a little in a little bit more deeper detail so have I got the review for you <laughs> <laughs> another one I love that about you Cliff you just that's awesome um okay so um, hopefully, Paul, that gives you just a few ideas on kind of how to use it and, and how they're used. Um, Trudy says, hi, Mickey, I'm weight training three days a week. She's marath marathon training as well, four runs a week. She's doing a lot. How much protein should I be aiming for each day? And are there any other supplements she should be taking? She's currently taking magnesium and iron and uses protein powder after training. Yeah, so I would say at a bare minimum, 1.4 grams per kilo body weight per day, and that's a bare minimum. Yeah. So again, getting up probably closer to two grams yeah. <clears throat> per kilo body weight per day, I think that's a, a really nice mark for most people, and particularly with that level of training. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the supplements, I, I'm a big fan of of using a, like a hierarchy approach to, mm. to supplementation. So you, you don't want to sort of jump forward and take something that might give you a little benefit, but it's not a, a foundational or, or sort of core supplement. So I, I really think that the first supplements that I look at are a good quality multi, a fish oil and a protein powder. Mm. Protein powder obviously just supports that protein intake. It's, it's just, sometimes difficult for people to get in enough consistently. That's just the nature of life. And I have no problem with taking supplements to help make life easier. So that's basically where that fits in. I think there's, there's, you know, far and away enough evidence to show us that multis can help to, to plug the gaps in a diet, yeah. even if we're trying to eat really well. And there's, you know, really good functional endpoints for that as well, improved all cause mortality, all sorts of stuff. So I think those, those things are really key. Obviously fish oil, I'm a big fan of as well. Um, and so I would be taking those first, then it would really come down to the individual. So, um, you know, she mentioned she's taking magnesium. I imagine that's to help sleep and to help with muscle relaxation, to help with energy provision for the muscles, because obviously ATP is bound to magnesium. And so um, that, that's really cool. Uh, with respect to iron, I would always take that under the guidance of a practitioner because you obviously want to have normal iron ranges and I know that you sort of like people to be at the higher end of normal but still within that normal range you don't want to have excessively high iron mm. um, thankfully most women don't so that's that's a good thing um, but outside of that I don't really think there's anything on top of that that anyone would need to be taking you may have a different perspective but I would tend to look at that on a case-by-case -case basis and look at what is going to most benefit their performance or if they've got other um, conditions or things that might um, necessitate a different supplement. Yeah, totally. And and I'm with you, Cliff, on in all of that. And particularly what I would say is certainly that increased protein. So I, I'd be up at that two, two grams per kg body weight rather than down at that 1.4, in part because obviously of its role and its structural role in musculoskeletal and, and bone health, but also just in its ability to help kind of regulate blood sugar and with appetite and, and things yeah. like that. And really focus on getting kind of equal distribution, maybe four times across the course of a day. Whenever you are eating, you want to make sure that that meal or that snack, like I really like to have that that protein is is the kind of key macronutrient with carbs and fat falling in and around that and yeah. particularly carbohydrate being in and around training I think that's key for recovery and potentially as well carbohydrate so if you're training in the morning that's you know bumping up that um, carbohydrate in breakfast but balancing out with that protein and a bit of fat to help support blood sugar and, and energy 
And then potentially, because with a lot of training, it can impact negatively on sleep if your body is kind of recovering from that. So having carbohydrate in the evening meal can be really beneficial for, for people as well. Um, because carbs help boost your serotonin production, which is um, not only is it a feel good hormone, but it helps with that production of melatonin as well. So, yeah. so that can be beneficial. With regards to the iron, I'm absolutely with you in, in ensuring that you kind of know where your iron markers are at and are supplementing appropriately. Now, most recent research around iron for athletes does suggest that taking iron every second day if you're taking it rather than every day is going to help with your cells receptors or your ability to uptake that iron and taking iron about within 30 minutes of finishing training as well because of the um, hepcidin enzyme in the in the gut so hepcidin is an enzyme that increases in response to inflammation and what what we can see is that 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 hepcidin will rise post training to be at its peak at about three hours. And it's an enzyme that binds iron. So um, the most recent paper on this, a review actually just came out a couple of days ago, suggesting that that window of getting in your iron should be within 30 minutes of finishing training, probably in the morning, actually. So you might want to just look at how you're taking your iron and um, whether that's in line with these kind of uh, best practice recommendations. And also you mentioned that I like to see people on the higher end. And, and in fact, from a, from a kind of training perspective, that's another recommendation is just you know, you might actually be better being on that higher end as you're going into a high training block because your iron stores will deplete over the course of that training block. So it's almost like a bit of insurance, if you like. Yeah. And I 100% agree with you on that multivitamin comment because you place your body under significant additional physical stress and getting what you need from diet can be pretty challenging um, alone just on the basis of kind of you know real life and 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 things like that and finally and maybe this is in part probably because I'm doing it and I'm a bit of a marathon runner but creatine I know that you get a lot of creatine from um, or we get creatine from animal-based protein and you probably you're going to probably have sufficient dietary creatine if you do eat good amounts of uh, red meat, for example, in your diet. But, you know, it does have benefits from an antioxidant perspective and from a kind of strength and uh, power perspective as well. So there'd be no harm in, in probably jumping on board just a creatine monohydrate, um, maybe three grams a day, saturates the cells within three to four weeks. So I don't know. I, I'm now of the opinion that most people should probably be taking creatine. Creatine's fantastic. I mean, when we look at, again, those sort of hierarchies, once we've covered off what's important for health, if we're looking at, at you know, ergogenic or performance enhancing supplement, there's, there's only really two that have lot, massive amounts of evidence a big effect and a consistent effect. And there's lots that can work and there's mm. lots that do work and they're really interesting. But, you know, the, the two kings of sports supplementation are caffeine and creatine. Yeah. And out of those two, creatine is the, the king because the effect size can be pretty, pretty large. Yeah. So, you know, and across a range of different things as well, you know, it can improve uh, endurance outcomes, not as much as strength and power, but because there are strength and power components within endurance. Um, but it can also improve cognition and, um, you know, as you say, there's these other ancillary effects systemically as well. So there's a lot going on there. And so I, I 100% agree. And it's funny now that because it's not, I talked about this with uh, Karen the other day, I gave a lecture for her students at AET and um, we talked about the fact that creatine is not very sexy anymore. It's been, yes. it's been around for so long that people are like, oh, yeah, creatine. Well, what's the next big thing? You know, yeah. and you, you, people end up taking all these, weird esoteric supplements that maybe might work or you know in some cases probably don't or if they do they've got a very small effect size and they're not taking creatine yeah so that's why I, I always go back to that idea of it's like a pyramid right you go back to the bottom first are you doing these foundational things for health first are you sleeping well are you training are you, you know all those things then are we taking the the key supplements that are going to help to support the diet yes okay what's next well if you're an athlete hey creatine's a no-brainer 
Yes, super interesting, eh? And it's kind of like the comment that people make that, oh, well, you've just referenced this paper and it's from the 1980s, so it can't possibly be correct without, (laughs) you know, because anything old, anything that's been around for a while clearly has been usurped by, you know, something newer and sexier on the market, research, creatine, all those other kind of supplement based things. So um, that's a very good point. And I actually think, again, creatine is probably a topic in within itself that would be brilliant to kind of chat to with an expert about as well. We need to kind of put our thinking caps on, Cliff, as to who that might be. And then potentially we could have a little bit of a convo with all three of us because I feel like it's something which to get out into the... i tell you who I met in LA. Yeah. Anthony Omada. Oh, he he was the guy who originally released creatine, him and Ed Bird. So they started a company called Physique Augmentation Systems that originally had the patent for creatine for athletic use. Wow. And they sold that company along with the patents to a guy called Bill Phillips. And that's why EAS changed the name from Physique Augmentation Systems to Experimental and Applied Sciences. And that's why EAS were the first company to bring out creatine because they had the early rights to it we should have a convo about that because he would be an interesting person to talk to and got to say he's now behind Vitago oh is he yeah ah see that name's come up of late um in things that I've been listening to so um um you and I should have a conversation about that hopefully off here and I do love Bill Phillips I have a soft spot for that uh (laughs) (laughs) blonde curly haired man that's featured on the body for life it was his brother Sean Oh, no way. I thought that yeah, was yeah. Bill. I mean, no, that, Bill, was, Bill. Bill was jacked as well, but Sean was, um, yeah. He was the model. Well, Sean's still around. He is involved with, I think tangentially, he sort of knows a lot of the guys in the ISCN, and so you quite often see him popping up, making comments on the ISCN groups. Oh, interesting. Hmm. Hey, um, Cliff, um, I've got to leave it here. Got an appointment. You've Good stuff. been amazing as always. And we are making our way through these comments. And I know that we do what we do with regards to our conversation. But look, this is conversations with Cliff. And, <laughs> and like I, I just think guest spot. Yeah, totally. I just think it's um super awesome that people get the opportunity to kind of hear how you think and and I guess get an idea of just all of the things that you know about because you know a lot. Uh, which is awesome. Well, so works for me, Doc. We get to sit and chat for a bit and hopefully I know. people get something out of it. So. I know, I know. Win-win. It's such a win-win. So we'll leave it here for now and um, we'll um, catch up again soon. Awesome. Thanks, Doc. Awesome. Thank you. So unsurprisingly, didn't get through too many today because we do enjoy a bit of a chat, but hopefully you guys would have got some take homes outside of that that can help you with your health and nutrition approach. Now, as I said, one of the best ways to get hold of Cliff is to contact him through his Facebook page and you can find him under Cliff Harvey PhD. Also, seek out the Holistic Performance Institute if you're interested in understanding more the practical and clinical applications of nutrition and health and you're wanting to learn a little bit more in that education setting with those certifications and diplomas which the Holistic Performance Institute provides. Next week I sit down and talk to Zach Bitter who is one of the premier ultra marathoners out there and we discuss his training and nutrition approach in and around the ultra marathon event. Until then you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Mickey Willardin, on Facebook at Mickey Willardin Nutrition and over on my website mickeywillardin.com where you can also sign up to one of my meal plans which might suit your health and nutrition goals as I have a range of them related to real food nutrition, to fat loss, an athlete plan and a ketogenic longevity approach also. This is one of the best ways that you can support the podcast. Until next week team, have a great day and uh, I look forward to catching up with you soon. See you later.